two, and we are live. Welcome to the Secret History Living in Lawrence's Aquariums today. Uh, today we have Lawrence Kent, who is a friend of mine, uh, my uh, compadre in collecting around here. Pretty much one of the few people who will actually go from the club and wants to collect, but uh, he seems to always be game for an adventure uh, locally. And well, he goes all over the place, but he, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and Today we are in his uh, residence, and so we're going to share with you guys some of his fish and some of his, uh, how they got here basically, or, or what they are, or anything interesting that's going on while we're here. So, Lawrence, uh, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us. Happy New Year's Eve, and uh, welcome to the channel again. <laughs> Yeah. So you want to tell us a little bit about, I mean, how long have you been keeping fish or, 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 uh, in the hobby, so to speak? Oh, I think about, about 20 years. Okay. Yeah. About 20 years I've been doing it. Of course I did it when I was a little kid and then I went on a hiatus for a while. That's very I got back into it about 20 years ago. And then, uh, yeah, about 15 years ago when we moved out here, that's when, uh, my wife told me I had to liquidate my reptile collection. And so I gave up on reptiles and started focusing uh, more on fish once I got out here to Seattle. That's, so you were living in Egypt and you had reptiles and birds. Is that that yeah. was kind of a precursor to all the fish? Uh, I was in Egypt. I was really into finches and finches. reptiles and breeding tortoises and geckos and stuff. Then we moved to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And then I kept up with the reptiles there. Uh, finches didn't work out too well in St. Louis because I uh, couldn't keep them outdoors. But I was big on reptiles, and then I started getting into the fish a little bit when we got the opportunity to move out here about 15 years ago. Yeah. My wife told me none of the reptiles are coming with us. <laughs> uh, we were going to sell them all, which I did, and uh, now I'm just uh, focusing on fish. Very cool. Well, you focused well. You've got some of the neatest fish around, so uh, it's exciting. And so when you get fish, I mean, you're one of the few people I know who actually goes and gets the fish themselves and brings them back so how when, when did you first go like collecting like as an adult you know what how did you get back into that level of fish keeping <laughs> oh uh i guess it goes back about maybe about again about probably 12 13 years ago because of my uh, job uh i traveled to africa normally about six seven times a year and then i usually go to asia about once or twice a year too so i I realized, oh, I have this great opportunity to look for, you know, tropical fish where a lot of them come from. And so I was taking trips down to, like, for example, to Malawi and Tanzania. So I got chances to go diving in Lake Malawi and Lake Tanganyika. And then I started realizing, oh, this is a great way to see the fish in their natural environment and photograph them. And, and then in some cases, I'm able to collect them and, and, and bring some special ones home if I, if I find the right ones and the, and the right methods to do so. So then I've been doing a lot of traveling to different parts of Africa and had a chance to explore lots of different rivers and lakes and, and check out the, the local, local fish that are there. That's very cool. Um, so you kind of have, I guess, a deal worked out with work then, or it works out so you can take a little bit of time when you have to be there already for something. Is that how that kind of goes? Yeah, typically like I'll go to Nigeria, for example, for 10 days. Okay. And then on Sunday, but I don't have to do my job then. I'll sort of get up at the crack of dawn and spend an entire day out with my nets and with my friends, local fishermen friends, okay. uh, collecting and photographing uh, the local fish. Very cool. And obviously, uh, I'm sure a lot of folks watching have read, you know, your articles in Arizonas and things like that. So you've uh, also got quite a bit of work where you've got pictures and, and examples of your trips. So, you know, if people are looking... Uh, looking up your name, they'll probably find some examples of all the, your travels, I guess. Um, but, I mean, how did you first get in touch with, like, being a part of the hobby on the official level, you know, by uh, talking to magazines and stuff like that? Did they reach out to you or did you reach out to them or just naturally happened on a forum or online? Or You know, I, kind of, I think it happened mostly because of uh, Lake Victoria, because mm -hmm. um, I was going to Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania a lot and had a lot of chances to collect fish in Lake Victoria. Mm -hmm. And not that many people do that. And so... It's very difficult to identify cichlids in Lake Victoria. Yeah. There's like 500 species and to yeah. differentiate them is difficult. So I always, when I would take pictures of the fish, I would post them on Facebook and try to get feedback from other experts from around the world. Mm -hmm. And then some people like Greg Steves in particular down in Texas, who's kind of a Lake Victoria specialist. He got keenly interested in helping me uh, figure out which species of fish we were collecting there. And then he was encouraging me to, uh, you know, write things up. And I started to, uh, 
submitting things to tropical fish hobbyists and the local club magazines, the Bunt Barsh Bulletin from the American Cichlid Association. And yeah, and since then, some of the magazines reach out to me and ask me to, uh, to, to write up some of the stories. But Facebook is, as soon as I go, I take the pictures, I put them on Facebook the, almost the same day. Because yeah. I'm always trying to get feedback from other people. There's so many experts around the world who know a lot more about these fish than I do, and they, they provide insights on, on what their identifications might be. Sure, they can kind of specialize in, oh, I know that lake or that river region kind of thing. Yeah, well, that, that's really neat. So, you know, I've seen your talks, and I encourage everybody, you know, who has a local fish club, if you're in the area, catch his talks. One, they're really entertaining. And two, uh, I mean, you've collected in, like, western sahara right like or the whatever you want to call it i guess the islamic republic of western sahara would that be? <laughs> mauritania okay okay and so i mean there's some interesting spots like i you look at the map and you wouldn't think that there's a whole lot of fish there period um but yeah you've you've brought back fish from these places or or you know pictures of the trip and stuff and that area in particular i encourage everybody to see his talk if if he comes to a club and he's giving the talk on that um he went with his son and uh you were there for the peace corps was it or i was a peace corps volunteer in the islamic republic of mauritania like 35 36 years ago and in full circle you went back with your son and found i mean just cool story so you i mean it's a people story it's a fish story it's a cultural thing it's very cool so uh and you still work with people kind of i I mean in in those countries and things when you go there right i mean it's it's very much about um similar like uh uh, well, what is it that you that you kind of do when when you're going to these places? Like, how did you get a job where you're you know going these places? Basically, like, what what is it you do? Well, like? for the last fifteen years, I'm working with this charitable foundation based wow. here in Seattle, and so uh, part of our strategy is try to fight poverty and hunger in Africa and some of the poorest places in in Asia. And so most of those poor people really are farmers, smallholder farmers, and we're yeah. trying to help the help them get access to better seeds, better soil fertility management, ways to uh, improve their crops, improve their production, and make them more resilient and what they, what we call climate smart, better sure. able to withstand the drought. Oh, and sure. Flooding, uh, yeah. Of other challenges that are coming with climate change. Well, yeah, and I think, I think you know, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, it was so common during the Cold War for people to support a, an area by just dumping tons of food. And then whenever that support dried up, you know, all of a sudden there's millions of people that don't have access to that. So you guys are kind of doing it a more sustainable way where they can figure out how to support themselves in their own ecosystem kind of thing. Right. So because yeah, yeah. we're, we're fish people, the old analogy really works, you know, give a man a fish or yeah. a man to fish and you get him a fishing pole. And so we're trying to do the lot and trying to help farmers basically improve their productivity. Very cool. So, so, I mean, that's, that's an intro to you and folks who are, who are interested in that kind of stuff. Um, uh, I can always post some links and stuff to, to more info on that, but let's turn to this tank, which kind of represents a lot of your travels um, in, in one way or another, you know? Uh, and so what is, what's going on with this tank? We'll get a little close. I'll get a little closer so folks can see. Alex, the light was on a timer. So let me turn okay, yeah, the Sure. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, no problem. And uh, let's see, I might be able to even zoom in a little bit more on on the fish too. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the, is is this tank? I mean, are there any South Americans in here, or any? Is this all African? This is a West African biotope tank, basically. Wow. Yeah, the fish here are from Congo and Nigeria. Uh, and then with one exception uh, from the East African Lake of uh, Turkana on the Ethiopian uh, Kenyan border. Okay, and, so that would be the jewel cichlids. That's right. That's right. Uh, those are the jewel cichlids, the Hymetomus exul from Lake Turkana. Those wasn't bred here several times. I've got a lot of babies from them. They're, they're great parents because they can protect their fry even in this very busy community site. Very bright, beautiful fish. I think it's only been in the hobby now probably about five or six years, but it's a great, great jewel. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I wonder, in your travels and things, how many of these lakes and remote rivers do you think are still yet to be explored? Like, do you think there's still a lot of fish, like, you know, this jewel cichlid exists in one lake? Like, yeah. do you think there's still quite a bit of hope to find a lot more critters? I, I think certainly, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I've personally had this experience in Lake Victoria catching a lot of fish that people say they've never seen before. Right. <laughs> so, and uh, as we get you know further and further into more remote areas of uh, Congo, Gabon, Angola, there's going to be additional species found for sure. So, I mean, a lot of those regions have been unfortunately pretty war torn. And so, I mean, that's probably prevented a lot of scientists from wanting to spend, well, risk their life really to go find uh, ornamental fish or, or, I mean, for lack of a, a better name, I, I mean, they're not a food source necessarily, like a lot of those smaller fish. Um, and so the locals may know of them, but they may not utilize them in any big meaningful way, right? Like, uh, I mean, if you ask them what's in the river, in most places you've traveled, do they know every little fish or do they kind of just group the little fish as well? They're not edible, they're little fish, you know? Yeah, they're familiar with them all. But, but yeah, they, in my experience, uh, they won't really differentiate them that much at the species level. Because, yeah. yeah, if they're not for food, then they don't give them as much attention. It's interesting, a lot of the smaller fish, though, they will catch and then they sort of boil them and fry them up to eat them. Okay. Well, in some cases, they catch the smaller fish and then use them to bait. Oh, sure. The larger fish, that would be the, the big fish, yeah. Very cool. So, so that, that group, are you looking, I can see yeah. the yeah. that group. Yeah. African boss catfish. Those, those things are, are called uh, uh, Paleotropius uh, bufi. Uh, they used to call them uh, the Dabawi cats, but then they realized the Dabawi cat actually is a, a different, well, very similar species. But these bufi cats are African glass cats. They, they hail from Nigeria, actually. And uh, while they're a catfish, the great thing about them, as you can see, is that they don't hang out in the substrate all the time, but are willing to swim around in the midwater as a school. And uh, a very hardy fish, a, a great a great fish to keep it, but you, you definitely got to keep them as a school so you can see that great uh, yeah. schooling behavior. I mean, they are schooling tightly. They're not just shoaling. They're, that's neat. So that's probably a group of, what, 15 to 20, somewhere in there? Yeah, there might be 18 of them. Okay. Yeah, really easy to keep. They, they'll eat anything, pellets, flake food, frozen and thawed. Uh, and, uh, yeah, since I got those fish probably two years ago, I haven't lost any of them. Wow, so they're pretty hardy then, too. That's really neat. Uh, yeah. So when I came over here last time, we kind of uh, looked at some of these fish. Uh, but unfortunately, I lost my memory card is is well, it got stolen. So the the return had to happen. And I, I had to show some of these fish because, I mean, they're zipping around and they may look similar when they're all zipping around. But there there's a lot of different little fish in here. And so I'm just curious if if you have any favorites you'd like to kind of point out and i can i can always you know film at them if if there's any of the small ones before we t talk about some of these uh bigger well they're all hiding now <laughs> yeah i'm probably scaring them if you focus on on those uh those um what do you call them? the lamp by congo tetras at the top they those are the beautiful Lampi those are beautiful yeah they're infinica granis uh or antiochus uh, and they're called uh, Lampi Congo Tetras, and uh, in the right light, their 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 eyes uh, really light up in a in a, a bright blue color that makes them quite attractive. Uh, they're expensive fish. I think they were about twenty five bucks each. I purchased those from uh, the wet spot. Uh, okay. Imported them from from the Congo, but uh, they're a cooler, smaller fish. Wow. Yeah. I mean, those are beautiful. So those are from the Congo River itself, then. Uh, or a basin somewhere. Yeah, the basin. I'm not exactly sure. I, I had had a chance to collect in the Congo myself. That was about ten years ago. Wow. But uh, but did not collect any of these at that time. Did you? Were you collecting near the capital Kinshasa? Or uh, were you, I okay. Besides, uh, one place was called uh, Kinsuka. Okay. Which is uh, probably about ten miles north of Kinshasa, the capital. It's in uh, Stanley Pool. And there's a lot of great fish. Oh, so many different myriads and cichlids uh, and everything in that area. And then we went down to the rapids, uh, Kinsuka. Is that the cataracts? Is that yeah, what they call the it? cataracts, okay. exactly. Where Morgan Stanley and these people, when they explored that area, went down on those canoes and most of the men died. And Dr. It's, Livingston, I presume. Yeah, that the same Stanley, yeah. But uh, down there, there's huge rapids, and then you get the rapid-loving cichlids uh, there, like the Steatochromus types uh, or the buffalo head types. A lot of other cool cichlids, like uh, Orthochromus stormsi, we collected there. I have that in the other room. Uh, those ones we were able to capture there. 
Very um, cool. Man. I have a cold It's an African, uh, you know, the elephant uh, nose and the. Really cool also, we call those sometimes baby whales or, you know, they have different names, but those, those are a really neat one that now, you know, they're finding in the newest research that they speak to each other with over 30 different vocal cues. Yeah, and they use those uh, electrical electric, yeah. organ discharges. Yeah. ARDs, it's sort of like a Morse code to communicate yeah. amongst themselves. Yeah. They're super intelligent fish. There's one of them in here, which is, if I had to choose my favorite fish, it would be him. Probably here yeah, he's probably hiding. He might come out of that a little bit later, but that's the Tamandua elephant fish. Tamandua. Or, or, or they call them Campi, uh, Tamandua. And um, super smart uh, fish that uh, kind of dominates this tank. Uh, he does what he wants. Because uh, <laughs> uh, they say with the elephant fish, you know, they have the largest brain to body size ratio of, of any fish. So they're, uh, for pound for pound, they're the most intelligent fish. And you can see it in, in its behavior. Hopefully it'll come out. Maybe you can begin to see one of the discotodus is coming out here. The, the discotodus. Those uh, are beautiful. Uh, Those are little, wa yes. uh, watermelon. Watermelon, yeah. yeah. The, at the wet spot. In case anybody's curious about getting a hold of some of these fish, you can find them because also Lawrence frequently sells his spawns to the wet or trades or whatnot. So, um, I mean, the reason some of the fish are at the wet spot period is because of lions. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. They, of course, import, uh, import yeah. through, uh, through uh, I think, I hold it, which brings in fish from Nigeria. Uh, but they have some great fish. So, like that, yeah, those are just the produce, uh, black and white. Unfortunately, you're being a little bit shy right now, but those ones, uh, they did come from the wet spot. And, They've been terrific. The Disticotus often can get really, really big and problematic, uh, but this particular species, uh, which I think comes from the the Lefinini River in um, Republic of Congo, is uh, stays small, like in this four to five inch range, and it's a it's a great choice for 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 a West African tank. Yeah, I mean, and they their colors are really beautiful. I mean, so what are all these big guys that are schooling around the or mid sized fish that are yeah, those are uh, Bricinus longicinus. Okay. Sometimes I think they call them African long fin tetra. Oh, wow. They've got those orange eyes. That's a fish that I catch very commonly in West Africa, in Nigeria, Ghana, Benin, Burkina Faso. I've seen that in a lot of different places. It's a great, uh, pretty much a shoaling fish. Yeah. Uh, but really hardy. Catch them in the wild. Uh, they're not particularly spectacular looking, uh, though I do like the orange eye. But I, when I got these, I got them primarily because they make a great souvenir of all the different places I've been able to catch them with a cast net in, in West Africa. So that's why I wanted to have a group of them in here. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they're and they're they're quick, too. I mean, they're they're a big fish that's quick. I mean, you need a good sized tank for them. That's for sure. Yeah. But, well, fish are eaters, too. You put food in there. They're the first ones to gobble. Oh, them. OK. Yeah. yeah. So and, you know, it's impressive that you have. Plants are those real plants in there? Oh yeah, those are okay. all. They're all, all Anubias. Anubias, except one in the back there. Uh, Hedgelata, yeah. Uh, that's uh, Bulbitis Bul Bul yeah. Hedgelata or African water fern. There. I actually got that through uh, the, through the club through the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society for the Plant Auction. Uh, I bought that there. Probably Eric or I or someone brought it. Yeah, I had a I bunch mean, of it too. Yeah, it's a yeah, very uh, low light. Yeah, yeah. low light plant that works well in this town. So what's this big old Goliath guy right here that's starting to come out for us and yeah, say hello? Right up outside. That's a Heterochromus multidens. That is a, a very special cichlid that hails from a remote part of the Congo. And therefore, there's very few of them in the hobby. Uh, but they are uh, considered one of the most ancient lineages of, of, of cichlids. Wow. A lot of people say they look similar to... Uh, Central American cichlids. Yeah, they almost look like morphology. a or like a paku or something. Like they kind of got that rounded head for like some of the fish that eat fruit and seeds and stuff like that. Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. That, that the cranial profile is like a very steep like that. And uh, yeah, they there's been a lot of genetic studies on them trying to figure out whether they are related actually to uh, you know New World cichlids. And I think that's still uh, an an open question. So they're so old they may have been like. Uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, Pangea, Pan yeah, Pangea yeah, or yeah, Gondwana? Yeah, yeah that's things, wow. Yeah. I don't know much about that, but um, that's one of the reasons that a lot of people have been interested in. There's actually five of them in there. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say they're all being shy. Maybe later, if you want, I can put up and get some uh, sure. or something and see what we can draw about. Yeah, um, so that's interesting though, because those continents weren't together 
except for 43 million years ago. But like Corydora, for instance, are a 60 million year old fish that's in the Amazon. So, I mean, we, we have seen fossil records that go back that far. So it is possible that, yeah, they could be related to some of those Central American fish. Well, Alex, you're, you're a great researcher. So <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll, I'll find out. This, you can dig up on the yeah. Some what's uh what's going on with these guys are those uh the distochrome uh or what was it distochromus or distochrota that's one of the distochrotus black and yep yeah, uh the black and red one black and red yeah and that's called the watermelon distochrotus. okay uh, we didn't get a good shot of them earlier but they're they're really i mean they're interesting too all these fish have personality um you know sometimes nano fish or schooling fish each one doesn't necessarily look so inquisitive and like locks onto things and meddles with things, but all these fish in this tank seem to like kind of have uh, something going on mentally, you know, <laughs> more so than you, you see with sometimes the, I guess the everyday, the neon tetras and things like that, where uh, I don't so much anyways, maybe some people do, but I don't usually find a personality and say, Oh, that one's Bob. That one's, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I guess only with some of the specialists, like with the uh, the Tamandua elephant yeah. nose, that one's a friend. I don't, of course, I don't give them names, but that one I consider an individual. And then some of those big mukti bins, uh, also, they've come to have personalities, too. Very cool. uh, even though they're kind of slow-moving fish and kind of quiet, but I think at night they uh, they, they, they do uh, hunt around to see if they can uh, pick off any of the small <laughs> Yeah, fish. the one that's injured right now, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. You can see it, uh, so I kind of tried to uh, design this tank in such a way that there'd be, um, you know, some cichlids on, on the bottom strata. Yeah. And then some midwater swimmers, like uh, those African glass uh, catfish that are kind of, you know, maybe they swim about six inches off the substrate. And then you've got the longipinus uh, or, or the African longfin tetras that are kind of in the midwater. And then you've got those, um, the lampi uh, Congo tetras in the upper level. And so I try to fill, fill all the different strata in the tank. And I just noticed that in those lampi Congo tetras, there's, uh, the males, I'm guessing, have like a real long dorsal. That's yeah. cool. I mean, they're, they're really neat looking fish too. But that's very cool how you've got action on every level. I mean, you've also got... Uh, it looks like the, is that the angelicus that's yeah, hiding? Yeah, some in there. So the angelicus that usually is hiding down there. Yeah, I see some spots, but yeah, I can't yeah. tell for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's also a lot of some of Thomas Pergalus in here. He's pretty nocturnal, so I doubt we're going to see him. But that's a really spectacular uh, squeaker cat. Um, oh, that, sure. That particular species comes from Cameroon. Very cool. Well, do you want to maybe take a look at your fish room and, yeah. and uh, maybe we'll revisit this at the end and yeah, feed yeah. them a little bit? Yeah, I think if we, if we come back later, maybe we'll, we'll put some food in there. Yeah. Maybe just stand a little bit more distant and see if we can. Yeah, I'll, out some I'll of stay fish. back for this. Yeah, let's go into my fish room. Happy to show you what's going on. Good. There. All right, I'll follow you. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. You want a good old fashioned? Oh, yeah. There you go. I mean, that that feels like it could be at home at any dentist's office or something, right? You know, but I just have some many more interesting Victorian species in here. Uh -huh. And then uh, my kids and wife were like, "Come on, could you put something just old-fashioned and colorful in here?" So yeah, put the yellow lambs and uh, a few of the other uh, Malawi cichlids in there. It looks like some petrocolas are in here too. Yeah. Hey, okay. I I find oh, wow. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. So, I mean, as as any uh, qualified fish keeper, you've got tanks kind of uh, hiding all over the place. Oh, so. yeah. yeah. All right. Very cool. So this is really neat the way you've got all your, let me zoom out a little bit. This camera uh, kind of fixes, it doesn't let you zoom in and out manually. You have to like set 20%, 10%, which is frustrating. So let's, oh, it's a new camera, huh? uh, yeah, new software that we're using. All right, so now I've got it zoomed out a little bit so we can kind of see everything, but this is really neat. So you've got access points up here and here and then tanks. So are these 20 longs up here? Yeah, 20 long readers. Okay. Okay, and they're going that way, and then 40 breeders down there. 
Yeah. Yeah. Tell me more. Another plant that seemed to grow well above the tax. Flowering. So everything's running off this gem, this one gem cup. Okay, nice. And then you've got just uh, fluorescent lights up here? Yeah, they're all fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I put them up there probably a long time ago. Sure. Know, like, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just doing LED, uh, Have you, do you want to switch over to LED in theory, or are they, yeah, they do their yeah, purpose? Yeah. I mean, a lot of these fish you kind of keep in a natural biotope almost. So it, yeah. <laughs> so they don't they don't need they don't need the crazy highlight or anything for any. Uh, reason, you know, so. I'm, just, um, I'm much more of a fish guy than a plant guy, so I don't invest a lot in. I did. I do actually have a CO2 tank here that I don't use anymore. At one point, actually, back in St. Louis, I was a little bit more into plants, but now I'm focusing more on the fish. So very cool. Uh, I got them super high on the line. So somebody had a question too with your travels in West uh, Africa was, have you seen the Enigmatochromus lupans eyes, the oh. little uh, fro photo river? Yeah, no, I have, yeah. I have that. I think it was on either Liberia or Sierra Leone. And uh, while I visited both of those countries and worked with them in the past a long time ago, actually it was before I was really into fish. They also were war zones in civil war. That was yeah. the reason I was there. Liberia. Man, Liberia was probably one of the nastiest civil wars in history. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. But now it's kind of stabilized both there in Sierra Leone and places, and you're beginning to see a few aquas going back there. Of course, Oliver Lucanus, yeah, that fish is he was the one I think found it originally, and then uh, you got Yves Fermont, the uh, the French ichthyologist. I think he's taken a trip to Sierra Leone pretty recently. So hopefully, um, you know, we'll get some, uh, maybe even some additional. Actually, Anton Lamboy was over there. Recently. Really? Some new species of, uh, it some kind of, I think, pencil fish or some kind of little garter like fish in Sierra Leone. Not too spectacular looking, but more evidence that there's, you know, there's more additional to fish find. Back, yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it's really interesting because. Unfortunately, that region has just been super war torn. Um, but in the 1930s, I know that that was one of the first regions, 1920s and 30s, where like um, uh, Hamburg Aquarium, for instance, set like an ocean liner fit filled with fish tanks and they parked it off the shore off Sierra Leone and they sent like six different groups to go collect fish. And and then they came back. So in the hobby in Germany, and then let, later spread to all throughout Europe, that was one of the first regions to successfully really bring back the fish because they had not as big as the Titanic, but you know, like a steamship that they converted two or three floors of just to take care of fish, and they had people spending twenty four seven taking care of fish. Um, no, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's not quite as big a voyage as it would be to try to bring them to North America, for example. So, when you decided I'm going to go collect fish in with your son, for instance, in in Mali, or uh, and it's not necessarily like an open war zone, but there's Boko Haram, there's there's other groups in the area that aren't necessarily the friendliest uh, to Westerners, I guess, or to each other. Um, so, I mean, how how did you go about going there? Or is there, you know, you don't have to go into it, but was there a whole special thing you had to do to, you know, get visas and all that? Or was it, is it plausible to go there kind of thing? Like, it's it's just most people don't. Oh, it's plausible to go. Um, every country is different and every region of every country is different. So it's kind of hard to generalize. So most countries in Africa, you can visit without any major problem. I mean, in, if you're in the big cities, you have to watch out for crime, street crime, just like any big city. Yeah. But most countries are you know, relatively safe. You have to get a visa and you get inoculations, yellow fever, vaccination, and things like that. And of course, now it's gotten trickier with all the, the COVID vaccination requirements. Right. And, uh, generally, you're okay. But sometimes I, I work in areas that are a bit more dangerous. Like I actually lived and worked in Chad for a couple of years oh. in Central Africa. Yeah. They've had a lot of uh, civil war, internal displacement, things we had to be aware of and avoid certain areas. Tarek, 
route. Uh, well, that's why it's why I like people in the north. And, okay. Uh, in rebellion. Uh, and then uh, this more recent trip to Mauritania, I was, I wanted to go back to Mauritania for almost two decades, but they're constantly having terrorist problems there. Right. Uh, Islamic state aligned organizations that do kidnapping, unfortunately, and focus on some right. Westerners, particularly. So it was always a little bit too dangerous to go there. But then, yeah, I guess it was about two and a half years ago, I said, oh, I can't wait any longer. I'm going to go. And, uh, and, uh, like I said, I brought my son to come along with me because if we did get kidnapped, I didn't want to be all alone. <laughs> it was really hard to get a visa. Uh, you, you, had to inter- you had to fly to Washington, D.C., and do an interview at the Mauritania embassy to get a visa. And I was not willing to do that because yeah. I'm away from Seattle. But yeah. I read online that there's certain border crossings from the neighboring country of Senegal where if you cross, you can negotiate a visa. So that's what we did. Okay. We crossed at a place called Pemassan. Took about three hours of negotiation, but finally we did get a visa. We got into the country. And then when we were in the country, I decided, you know, we're not going to spend more than two nights in any single location. Again, right. just in case there's kidnappers out there, anybody, the word got out that there's some Westerners that might be a target. We wanted to be a moving target. At least yeah. <laughs> and then in Nigeria, they have tons of kidnapping problems as well. But usually when I'm going there, it's for work, and then they arrange for security, usually uh, basically police bodyguards to accompany us. And even when I go out to collect fish, they'll, they'll come along sometimes. Oh, wow, somewhere. okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, I was just talking recently about how there's all sorts of pirates, too, with the oil pipelines and stuff in Nigeria, where the Delta region is just super dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. So with all that preface that Let's just say these fish, some of them are hard to get. <laughs> um, you want to show us a few of them and I'll kind of zoom in and whichever ones you want to you know of interest. These are the ones that I happen to have because Lawrence so kindly gave me uh, some of them, uh, so, some middle-aged and a couple adults. And uh, these are the ones that are in my big 40 breeder. These are the Malungu. Malungu? Yeah, yeah, we call them uh, Hapochromus Malungu, or sometimes yeah. they're called Enterochromus. Uh, there's a lot of uh, this sort of uh, unfinished business in terms of the taxonomy of fish with Lake Victoria. Uh, so the generalized term is haplochromus, but some people like Green would break them down into a, a different genera, including the terochromus, which means basically a, a long intestine used to digest vegetative matter. Oh. I'm probably in that, in that category. Yeah. Uh, but this was a, you know, this was a, a species that uh, when we caught them in uh, Lake Victoria, probably going back about five, six years ago, uh, nobody could identify them. They didn't match up with any formal scientific descriptions. And so basically we decided it's, a, it's an undescribed species. It's a new species that hasn't been formally identified so far. And because I caught them in an area called Malungu, we decided we would just give them the provisional name of Hapochromus Malungu. Which, uh, and I brought back uh, a few as tiny babies, and we've been able to grow them up and uh, breed them over a couple of generations now. And uh, I'm doing my best to to get the fish out to the adverse, you know, interested in, in keeping a pretty rare and uh, I think interesting fish from uh, Lake Victoria. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Thank you for checking some off. Uh, yeah, I'm thanking me. Yeah, I mean, they're super interesting to watch. Um, people know from my filming at home that they've totally gotten rid of all my real plants and then they've like built these shelves up above the substrate where they've moved all the gravel and built like the ma- the main male who's very beautiful. I mean, he's bright, bright red and blue and yellow, every color of the rainbow. Um, he's definitely got like a system wh- how he arranges his little palace, and the females kind of taunt him and come and go, and, and you know it's, it, they're really interesting fish. You see this kind of fun sound It's almost like a little yeah. Like, sound Fry in the other room. They try to grow up uh, the next generation of these. Yeah. 
Looks like there's some actually some pretty young ones still right in here. Very cool. So, and then if we continue right around here, uh, we'll try to get rid of some of the people there. Might get a little closer. Oh, nice to everybody. Yeah, that's what you talk to them because they're they're dark. Uh, I don't. Are you you're looking right now? Oh, that's those are some of the ones we've seen us. And then uh, the yeah, big old black fish that are. Yeah, that is a tilapia this color. And that is a fish not very many people at all have in the hobby. One of the reasons is it's not particularly beautiful. I don't know, you're catching a little bit. There, are, there is a lime green on it. I think yeah. you can see a little bit on your hand. Yeah, you can see in the tail. It can be actually really beautiful green. This is a, uh, obviously it's a tilapon. It comes uh, uh, from Lake Bosa of Tui in Ghana, which is a crater lake uh, in the Shanti area in the middle of the country. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, I, I went there once and, and collected these fish. But these particular specimens I obtained from importer. Oh, yeah, you can see the blue and green. But so far, they have not been for me, surprisingly. From that, I, I, I'm thinking of the a great souvenir of a, a, a wonderful couple of trips that we take to Ghana uh, in the people who have fish photography. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the Enteromians, uh, the barbs that you see there, yeah, they're, they're, they're called Enteromius uh, ablavis. They're also from Ghana. A great uh, hardy barb that uh, makes a great sort of, uh, you know, accompanying fish. So I like the idea of keeping the sinkers with the barbs. So it just keeps, a, yeah. it keeps that sort of together to keep the uh, sinkers a little bit uh, happier, even though they are pretty shy right now with the camera shy. Not that many people visit this fish room, Alex. Yeah, I know. So the reason people are not used to this, unfortunately, they do tend to hide a lot when a new person comes into the room. But I'm honored, though, that, that you're letting us take a look. And, you know, I, I know it's... It's, uh, you know, we don't have any fancy camera gear or anything going on, but I mean, thank you, because you just have really neat specimens, and each one of these things has a story, which is cool, you know? It's it's very cool, so thank you. This tank might be my favorite in here, yeah. uh, just because of the variety and the, the beauty of some of these. Uh, do you still have the blue and green lip buffalo heads in here, or is it just the well, I do have the blue uh, buffalo head cichlids. That's Caragodia uh, cichla urbani. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, and the blue buffalo head cichlids. Those are ones that are really, I think, virtually every urbani in this country you know, descended from a meeting at the place this very time because I kept them for a number of years. I collected them. I was lucky enough twice to go and try to find them. And then eventually was able to uh, find them and photograph them, and then I've read a lot of them in this tank, and I've distributed them. They're all over the country right now. Great, great fish because they form that great pair bond between the male and the female, and they're in their good parents. So, but I, I've moved on from them now. I, I, I saw them on the wet spot about yeah. uh, six months ago, and now I've got some other fish. But if you see on the bottom substrate, there's a bit of a checkerboard fish right there. Yeah, I think you can capture it. That's also called the storm side. Uh, to the right, just a uh, little bit to the right, Alex, and you'll get uh, the, there she is. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. that's a male. That's what's the kind of storm side. That's the fish that comes from the Congo. I actually collected that fish in the Congo, but this one was sourced from a different, uh, a different supplier. Uh, so that's another um, um, fish that likes the, the, the rapids, and so we caught that in amongst the rapids in the, in the Congo. That's the male, and uh, the females are a little bit more subdued in the coloration. Uh, I, I think the face is kind of, it's almost like a, you know, a war, war, war paint or something yeah. like that. And, uh, I've got a bunch of fry and I was able to cook the breed them and hopefully going to raise up another generation of them. Well, my favorite fish in the back of the substrate, uh, right there, yeah, that, that is a congoensis, Lepralogus congoensis, also from the Congo River. And uh, that's the male. And then to the right, you see a darker fish, yeah, who's sort of looking at the camera right now. Yeah. She's a female. Uh, and they've got a good pair bond between those two, and they're using the caves in the back to, uh, to spawn, uh, lay eggs in the caves, and then uh, they take over the fry for a little while, and eventually these other fish pick them up, unless I go in there and, and pull out the fry. As I have done a couple of times, I do have a bunch of babies in one of the other tanks here. That's a uh, Lepralogus congolensis. Lepralogus congolensis. That's that's kind of cool, the, the speckling on the male almost looks like chain mail or something, like the silver tone. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, it's a lot of chain mail. I mean, there's actually some different that shows up in the in the tail sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they're defending their cave just a little bit, it looks like. Yeah, yeah, there's competition for good spots in there. <laughs> yeah. And then the barbs that you see 
is uh, in terms of uh, 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 the flipper bar. The flipper bar. They call that. That's a pretty common fish that we find in Nigeria. I've collected it many times, but almost never imported. Uh, but then this guy Dan from Dan's Fish in Wyoming. Oh yeah, he he's wonderful. He imports very interesting species that nobody else does. He put in his flipper bars. So I, I bought those from him. And he uh, emailed them to me uh, about six months ago from his uh, his facility in, in Wyoming. And uh, yeah, he's just, a lot. he's just started. Well, I mean, not just started, but he's almost done actually building an all new warehouse and facility and everything. And so, he, yeah, really expanding. So I'm, I'm excited about it because he's got some, yeah, like you said, he brings in really neat fish. I'll definitely put in the description after this video loads. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link to his his site uh, and anything we talked about that that has a link. I'll I'll try to throw in. So yeah, certain people that I like fish from uh, Dan's fish is one of the best. And when they they pack each fish individually, and they manage them with great care. Yeah, it's really dedicated to conservation. And of course, I also love the the West Fork down in Portland yeah. because does such a great job and offers a large selection of fish. Totally. Too. And then Dave's Red Fish uh, down in Texas also. Yeah. Like, Shumont, he does a great job too. Bringing in the fish. And, uh, he's always so fair and his feelings. I like buying fish from him sometimes too. Very cool. So if we go up a level, and you guys can see all the the uh, Jonah's Aquarium, the green yeah. fish net. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then so we're just going to kind of take a look and I'll probably stare at everything and I don't know how the player is going to look but we've got a selection of uh, different fish in all these tanks here and oh that's a, is that a little sunfish what is that yeah that's a banded sunfish from the uh, pine barns in New Jersey oh wow yeah. And you, did you grow up out near New, New I, Jersey? I actually did. When I was a little kid, I used to live in New Jersey. And uh, yeah, I went out in the pine barrens about a year ago with my sister. And uh, we caught uh, we caught those uh, uh, banded sunfish. Very cool. And so we've got New Jersey. We've got Africa. Uh, do we have any yeah, other? Yeah, 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 Oregon. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then we went, we went back to the Willamette River, where the banded killifish has been, unfortunately, but interestingly, introduced as an invasive species. It's originally from the southeast part of the United States, but a few little spots in the Willamette River in Oregon now have, um, have come to host uh, small colonies of these banded killifish. And so we went out there in October, and we caught about two dozen of them. I got about, I think, about eight of them here indoors, and then I'm also keeping about eight of them outdoors in an outdoor tank. Uh, they're out there in the cold right now. So far, they seem to survive the cold as well as the warmth. So I'm interested to see which ones maybe will spawn in the spring. And they'll be the ones that have gone through that cold period out the, outside in the garage or then these ones that have enjoyed more fair weather indoors will uh, hopefully lay some eggs in the in the uh, vegetation in the spring. Yeah, I mean, that's cool though. That, that So those are the ones from Fishtoberfest. I know Kenny's watching, so hey, Kenny, but... Uh, so Fishtober, as you went collecting in, in outside of Portland. As an expedition, I, uh, I made it a condition upon my participation at Fishtober. I said, happy to give it up, but you got to make it, uh, make sure we can go out and catch those bad fish and be successful. Um, we can, and uh, a couple of other club members had a great time. Did Roland go out with you guys too? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah very cool. These guys are Propatopus and Mesotinia. That's an interesting little lamp eye. Uh, hard to tell. They're super gorgeous in the right light. Uh, those I've collected in uh, Nigeria. So these ones I stored from a different uh, a different person. But there's only three of them left. There used to be more, but a bunch of them unfortunately died in the great heat wave that we had this summer. So I just have that group of three. But there is a male and, fe and two females. So I do have some mops in there, hoping that they might give us some eggs maybe in springtime. Interesting. People are, sorry, one sec. People are saying they can't hear the sound for some reason. I wonder what's going on. I wonder if it's this corner, like, all the, maybe the Wi-Fi. Let's see if we step away. Can you guys understand what we're saying now, or what's it, what's the issue, guys? Is it sounding robotic, or is it just muffled or quiet, or what's going on? Viewers, we want to make sure you guys can hear. Uh, here that's okay and i see comments people saying they can't hear what's going on uh so i want to make sure that you guys can i guess no point talking if you can hear you uh oh no, uh let's see 
Um, the sound is very muffled. Interesting. Let's see. Has it been bad since we were in the other room too, guys? Or did this just start? Mm. Oh, huh. let's I'll step towards the door and see if that helps. Can you guys? Oh, it sounds like we're underwater. Interesting. Oh, okay. Well, they said we lost it in the fish room. <laughs> um, let's see here. Well. Yeah, I can come film these tanks, or we can do that or whatnot then. But do you want to maybe feed that other tank then? Is that okay? Or... Sure. So we'll go back to where we had reception, and uh, Lawrence is going to grab some food. And hopefully, if you guys can hear us in this room at least, yeah. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll... Yeah. I'll just... yeah, I'll stay still for them. See if we can hear... Yeah, we can do a fish room video, guys. Um, I'm going to sit here while he gets some food, and we're going to see if we can get the fish uh, are coming out. Sorry, guys. Thanks for telling me, though, that you couldn't hear anything. Um, well, we had to, we, to have the uh, camera zoomed in. We had to actually have – we're in StreamYard. And so we don't have any of the, ch we didn't have any of the chat up while we were in the room until, so I got it up on another device. And so now I see y'all, um, but we're going to feed this tank. If you guys can hear us, can you hear us? Um, and yeah, we will try to record the. You couldn't hear or see anything for 10 minutes. Oh, sorry guys. Um, yeah, it was, must be because the, that fish room is in a brick area. Uh, so we're on his Wi-Fi, and we have an extender and everything. Like he has a nice Wi-Fi set up. So, but it's a, it's an older house. So it's probably the basement. That's what it is. So we're going to, we're going to give this a shot and, uh, try feeding some of them. Oh, that's cool. A syringe thing, you, or a little baster thing you got there. Yeah, he's going to get the one that's probably the very cool. Is that for feeding coral and stuff? Yeah, I think so, yeah. People are saying there's okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to restart the video then. We'll see if we can get a better feed. Hold on guys. Let's see here. Um, man, that's odd. I wonder why it went. All right, guys. Can you hear me? Oh, now we got feedback, of course. Are you guys getting any feedback? I'll just probably be quiet here because I think we're getting an echo. Even though there's only one stream up, it's a glitch. <laughs> oh.
recently noticed one of the videos on the corner of it. Yeah. You can see the synodon with that delicacy maybe behind that wall coming out of it. Oh, yeah. It's funny because they're the biggest ones. Yeah. I'll put some food over here on the right hand side. With that. Oh, yeah, it's a big guy. And then we got one of the most. Those get super red at night. They turn bright red at night. Amazing watch. They do a transformation. Nighttime clothing. Pajamas. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, another reason why 2021 stuff. <laughs> well, it's 2018. Yeah. Uh, New Year. Let's see. I think I got some. I got some of that massive here light up in here. That might have something. Yeah, somebody struck the top. So I know. Oh, there's a warmer right too. Oh, he saw me. <laughs> Play that big fish is cool.
but the train has a very intelligent fish, so I think he's so smart that he's smart enough not to not to look into the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to help his wild friends out. Um, we don't need to be popular. This guy just even just like, oh, no, 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 Seems suspicious of him. Uh-huh. Oh, you guys can hear again? Am I echoing to you guys, or can you hear? Okay. I'll get some video uh, for you guys that's not choppy, but I was hoping the live would work better than it did until we went in the fish room. Sorry. And sorry to go through time. You know what? Maybe 